Kate Wilson? Reed Schumann? Marsha Savitsky? Chuck Van Etten? Here. Jeff Haney? Here. Bill Trepanier? Don Pettit? Here. Carol Pearson? Sabrina Dunlap? You have a quorum. Okay, is the draft ordinance. Uh, Jenny, would you like to um, discuss the ordinance? Matt is going to go over the differences. Okay. Um, I do have uh, something I would like to say, but. All right. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, so what I'm going to just do is kind of quickly go over the ordinances from where they were when you last met uh, discussing these back in June and to where, where we are now. And so just kind of give a quick synopsis, what kind of things we took out, what are, are, have been put into place. Um, over, our overall goal was to shorten the ordinance and simplify things. Uh, to take out extra material that was not needed um, or in some way duplicative from either what was already in this ordinance or from other state statutes and codes that are existing and that we already use for tourist rooming houses or anything that was uh, not you know, really enforceable. Um, kind of the big scope uh, of these ordinances were to address occupancy, owner and owner's agent's responsibilities, notifications and inf informing neighbors, and then overall enforcement as well. Um, <clears throat> as we go through these, I just kind of go by the, the different sections. Um, at the beginning, uh, talk about the purpose and intent of the language. We did kind of shorten that up and uh, abbreviate it as, as well. And so I'm assuming everybody's had a chance to, to read through all those. Um, in 14.4.1, the definitions, we took out um, the definition of a county health officer designee. We just kind of encompass all that into the, the definition of county health officer, which also implies that it, it, it uh, pertains to their a designee as well. Um, we took out the word definition of dwelling, a lodging marketplace, occupant, and the word sale. These are mostly because we took that language out of these sections um, in later on in the in the draft, and then no longer needed those definitions. Um, in fourteen four three, application for a tourist rooming house license, the required information, uh, we shortened and eliminated some of those requirements um, that didn't really need to. Uh, was it needed for them to apply for a license? So such as um, providing a copy of the sanitary permit, which is already on record with zoning and um, part of this application process would go through zoning as well as a detailed site plan. Um, didn't necessarily need an individual to lay out. Uh, uh, we have air photos, we can kind of look at that stuff nowadays and so don't need a, a detailed plan um, just to, to tie up more time. So. Um, talking about the application process, just note that this process would be um, taking place at the same time one would apply for a state license. So county and state license would be one process, uh, kind of try to do it as a seamless um, process though that there aren't uh, too many more additional things that an applicant would have to do uh, and, and streamline everything. Um, going through to 14.4.5, talking about the terms, um, renewal of a tourist rooming house license. We added a section, the letter D, 
um, which basically indicates that a tourist rooming house owner or owner's agent would notify neighbors within 300 feet of the perimeter of that rental facility. So that's one kind of a significant change from uh, the previous version that you saw. Um, uh, 1446, talking about inspections, there was some talk about that um, uh, previously. And so we took our language out and basically we're just uh, stating what the state statutes and administrative codes are. And so it's verbatim, we are creating our own language. It's what is required by, by state code. Um, 1448, owner's agent. Um, we shorten the language for the section under appointment by owner. Uh, again, the authority language shortened that language, summarized it into just one statement and um, simplified those requirements. Uh, contact information uh, that is not on this version, that was on the old version. This was removed and is incorporated into uh, section 1449 under notification to neighboring properties. Uh, 1449 owner responsibilities. We removed the, the term code of conduct. Um, basically, we didn't give any specifications as to what that code of conduct should look like or say or what any of that um, should involve. So it was too generic. We took that language out. Um, records was um, basically we're using the same requirements as the state for record retention. Uh, we remove language for uh, lodging marketplace. We also remove language for uh, receipt of notice and then incorporated a new language under the letter C for required signage. Um, posting con this is the uh, signage requiring owners and owner agent to post information at the kind of like the junction of their their driveway their main driveway and the main road informing neighbors the public of a rental facility and providing contact information also on the 1449 um, notification to neighbors it had gone back and forth within the committee um, as what the distance should be for notification. We've had, it started at 300, it went down to 100, and now the final proposed proposal is to um, inform neighbors and those in the community that are within 300 feet of that perimeter of the, the facility. Um, under 14411, occupancy and minimum requirements. Um, Basically, the, the big note there is addressing occupancy, the maximum number. It went from uh, two people per bedroom uh, based on septic size to two people per bedroom plus an additional two per facility, not per bedroom, but two additional people for the whole entire facility. Um, 14.4.12, tourist rooming house regulations. Uh, we took out uh, some things that didn't necessarily need to be there because they're duplicative to the state codes so that was ingress, ingress and egress. Um, and then we added two additional things, uh, language for recreational burning. So campfires having a setback of 20, 25 feet, I believe is what we had put in there. And then um, language for waste and recyclables because the state code did not really address for the area that we live in and addressing critters such as bears and raccoons and other animals that uh, we just wanna make sure that those uh, types of structures and facilities are, are secure. Uh, 14, 4, 13, enforcement, and particularly under the calls of service, we um, have the calls, uh, three or more calls for service within three months. Um, that was the same, but then we changed it to say that um, if you were to uh, get three phone calls within, um, sorry, I just screwed that up. Um, if you were to get more than three phone calls within three three months, then you would be we would be looking at a revocation potentially for that license. Uh, previously, it was if you were to get five in in a year's time. That is basically the changes that are were noted from the previous version that was pre presented in, in June to where we are today with this version.
Ginny? Good evening, um, Ginny Chabak, 10363N McLean Road. Um, thank you to the board for allowing me a few minutes to speak to you regarding the updated version of the draft TRH ordinance that you have in front of you this evening. Sawyer County has its own way of doing things. For some, the 2017 ordinance was just fine. For others, any licensing ordinance that regulates short-term rentals is just too much. After one restart, a few iterations, a compromise has been reached that passed committee by an eight to two vote. This ad hoc committee is no, by no means a rubber stamp. Um, everyone voiced their concerns. And now I feel a sense of urgency to move this ordinance forward to the full county board. More importantly, what this ordinance represents is uniquely crafted for Sawyer County. It recognizes that tourism in Sawyer County due to our events happens in every season and it happens sometimes just for weekends. It also leverages our own HHS department's expertise and local short-term rental market. It is a solid attempt to protect our natural resources are limited resources, both natural and infrastructure. And it recognizes that people who live here because they respect these resources, deserve respect for their rights and a little peace and quiet. The changes most notably include, um, not to repeat what, uh, what Matt just went through, but the increasing the occupancy still based on septic capacity, but two per bedroom plus two per dwelling. Um, increases the requirement for the owners to notify their neighbors to properties within 300 feet, which is standard for zoning when they have to send out notifications. Um, the committee went back and forth on that. We started at 300, went down to 100, ended up back at 300. Um, and it also requires owners or owners agents to post their contact information. That's the most critical things I think, although, you know, Matt did a really good job of going over all the changes that were based on recommendations made by members of the committee to the HHS folks that have been working on this, um, who put a lot of time and effort into getting it done. I hope that the members of the board see the work that's been done and feel like me, that it's the right thing to do right now for Sawyer County to go ahead and move this forward to the full county board. Thank you. Uh, Andy, do you have that? Yep. Uh, Lynn, can you scroll to the first page of the page 16? Yep. So as just some background data uh, regarding two swimming houses in Sarah County, we put together just a few panels of information um, earlier this summer, uh, back in June, actually after it was at this committee uh, the first time. Just thought it might be helpful to give a little perspective on why we're discussing the uh, ordinance or the need for the ordinance. So uh, some of this is a um, refresher for those who have seen it already. But um, first slide is residents of tourist swimming house owners. Um, this is not a real scientific or uh, deep dive into the data. We just looked through all 600 licenses that are issued by public health as the agent of the state and looked to see where their mailing address was for each of the owners. And that showed us that 38% of uh, those owners are, we believe, probably tied to Sarah County or in Sarah County on a full-time or close to full-time basis. 24% are, excuse me, 4% are in adjacent counties, 24% are in the remainder of Wisconsin, and 34% are out of state. And that is spread amongst 23 states. Uh, the next slide shows the number of operating tour swimming houses in Sarah County and uh, how they have kind of come into the system again, not a deep dive. So we didn't really track like those have been licensed and are no longer licensed. These, these just summarize those who are currently licensed. Uh, 62 of them were licensed prior to 2009. That's as far back as we could f find them. Then you can see, um, you know, single double digit growth um, from 2010 to 2017, a bit less than 20. 
And then it really starts to increase in 2018 and 19, there were 50 additional, 2020, 56, and then 81, 93, 91. And this is through June, uh, through the current license period, uh, renewals, there was 55. I don't know how many have been added since June, but that's where we were as of June. And that gets us to about the 600 mark for the number of licensed tourist swimming houses in the county, a breakdown by municipality. Um, you can see Hayward, Lenroot, Bass Lake, Spider Lake, Hunter, Round Lake, Sand Lake um, have uh, more than 50 each. Uh, Hayward, Town of Hayward has 86. Uh, you go down to Winter, 40, Edgewater, 31. Excuse me, then the city of Hayward, 13. Uh, we still show one in Coudere, although that's in dispute that it might actually be in the Town of Sand Lake. Um, number of TRHs by Wisconsin County. Um, so this is really the one where we've, you know, noticed uh, uh, you know, a lot of increases around the state. Door County uh, has over 1,200, Vilas County, 1,018. I should say this specific set of data um, is probably a little bit older, back closer to the first of the year. We have not gotten any updates on this. But Sawyer County, Walworth, Brown are all right around that little less than 600 mark or over 600. Um, those numbers have probably changed, and then it goes down from there. Um, to uh, and this just shows uh, the counties that have more than 100. Just about every county in the state has at least uh, one, but we just cut the chart off at, at 100 to provide some perspective on where Surrey County is relative to the rest of the state. Um, also here, um, I know the question came up the last time this uh, board discussed the rooming house ordinance and the question was asked, or is Surrey County the only one uh, doing an, an ordinance, and I, I kind of messed that answer up because I say you know, most of the counties already have this. Some of the counties right now in the last year have been redoing theirs, and um, so yes, yeah, Surrey County is not unusual. Uh, we just tried to summarize some of the key uh, components of a license or a permit that counties are issuing, the ones that have been discussed the most here, including occupancy and how they arrive at an occupancy standard how they notify property owners, uh, either through a letter or signage, uh, do they have local agents, and then do they have some sort of parking requirements. And you can see, um, again, this is a little dated. Bayfield County did adopt their short-term rental as a permit. Um, most of the counties that, and we focused on the top 10 and the ones adjacent to us. Um, uh, Ashland and Washburn are the only ones we found that did not have anything, although Ashland is starting work on theirs, I understand. Some do it as a conditional use permit through zoning, some do it as a separate permit or license, either through zoning, a land office, or our human services through public health. Um, they have different names for them. Um, most of them have some, some sort of occupancy requirement, whether it's based on the pouts of two people per bedroom, or they're using a two people per bedroom plus two. Um, there are a couple that don't have um, occupancy or use some other um, form of uh, establishing it. And then you can see there, you know, some require signs, some don't. Uh, some have signs at the driveway, some are attached to the, the unit itself. And then most, I would say, have some sort of local contact and some sort of proximity that the local agent, local contact uh, needs to be within in order for a response time. And then most have some sort of parking requirement. Some is just that parking has to be contained within the parcel. Some have actual parking spaces per bedroom. Um, but all I'd say most have some sort of parking requirement. So we just did that as a, well, I guess a resource for the ad hoc committee to be able to look at some of those other ordinances and um, permit processes to get an understanding of what else is out there. And this is just county specific. I, I don't think we included um, like Door County, which has the most. We really didn't summarize their countywide ordinance because they, they, they pretty much rely on each of their municipalities that have pretty strong short-term rental um, ordinances. If you're familiar with Door County, obviously, you know, Sturgeon Bay, Sisters Bay, um, Egg Harbor, they all have their own at the municipality level. And then just to help out with some explanation of the tourist swimming house ordinance, we put together an FAQ sheet to answer some of the more popular questions. Um, I'm not going to go through that. That's there for anybody that wants to kind of read, read the responses as to why things are the way they are in this ordinance or why did we why did the ad hoc committee consider some things and not others and how it should be interpreted? Any questions for Abby? 
I do have a quick question. Is the cost of the license pretty much the same throughout state? No. No, that's, you know, we specifically, I'll just kind of skip over the top end and come back to it. We did get into the uh, cost of the license. Um, some counties have a flat fee every year. Some have an upfront, like the first time you get licensed, it's $500 and then every renewal is less than that. But I, you know, I would say it's one to $500 someplace in there. Um, we specifically, and this is mainly from administration, I would say have steered clear of getting into that. Um, we will need to address that very quickly after the ordinance is adopted. But what I wanted to do is if the ordinance is adopted, we'll, we know what, you know, we'll be able to work with our public health staff and zoning staff to say, okay, what type of work do we need to implement and enforce this? And then we can set permit fees based on the workload. Any other questions? Uh, we did have um, one letter that was sent to us um, that I don't think everybody got that I can read into record from a Jerry, I'm going to murder this last name, Pachesek. Um, Dear Julia, I have two cabins on Lacoudere, and there are some of my concerns regarding the proposed tourist rooming house ordinance as listed below for tonight's meeting. A, the proposed ordinance are clearly intended to reduce short-term rentals. B, the proposed ordinances should be studied for their impact on tourism spending. C, the proposed ordinances discriminate against non-local owners. D, proposed ordinances should be changed to encourage tourist rentals, but increase fees to cover inspection and other costs. E, current rental properties should be grandfathered into any restrictive zoning. F, the provo proposed ordinances have been hidden from the public and are contrary to Wisconsin's tourism spending. And finally, the proposed ordinances unfairly punish small rental properties that could default in loans without rental income. There were a couple of emails that came in. Were you able to read those emails earlier? Linda Zilmer oh, yeah, sent one. Okay, so you had a chance to read them. Okay. Um, we have one person that would like to speak, Doug Kurtzwell. And we have three minutes, Doug. Douglas Kurtzwell, 11055W Arrow Road, Hayward, Wisconsin. Uh, I appreciate the efforts that everyone has put into this uh, process. Uh, I think they have made some progress. I don't think it's quite ready for prime time. Uh, something that I find concerning on um, page one of the draft thing, uh, purpose and intent. The purpose of this ordinance is, quote, to respect the rights of private property owners to use and enjoy their property and to ensure that lodging units rented for tourist rooming houses or short-term rentals are operated in a manner that protects the health, safety, and quality of life for the residents." Close quote. Uh, this ordinance doesn't do that. I'll get into that later. But this is a verbatim quote from a PR piece of one of the three largest lobbying organizations in the state of Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Realtors Association. And that probably explains uh, a lot. Uh, I have some concerns. I, I've asked uh, a couple of times, but apparently I was told this evening to take a freedom of information request to find out. Uh, so we've got a percentage of owners of licenses. I asked how many owners are there actually. Some owners have multiple licenses. Some licenses have multiple units. We don't have a count on how many units there are, who owns them, what the breakdown is. And I think this is information that probably should be available uh, to everyone involved in, in this process. Uh, there was a facilities in uh, the text that, that Matt was reading. Uh, if someone's got like a, 
a four unit uh, resort facility. Uh, so it's two per, two per bedroom plus two per facility. Is that a cabin or is that the overall operation in, the, in an example of like a four cabin resort? But uh, again, it's, it's, it's kind of nebulous. The affidavit, who has to sign an affidavit? The recipient of the complaint, the county officer who is the recipient of the complaint, or does the poor neighbor have to go to an attorney and get an affidavit drafted and notarized and all of that? And so again, the big problem with all of this, as I've said before, uh, you can draft perfect ordinances that everybody agrees with. But if there is no meaningful, realistic mechanism for enforcement, they're crap. And uh, I would also, I guess I'll close with this. Uh, I can find it very quickly here. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. The mechanisms for enforcement in here do just the opposite of ensure domestic tranquility. You're driving a stake through the hearts of our rural neighborhoods, and it's happening already. Thank, Thank you. you Doug. Thank you. Um, we have another uh, person that would like to speak, Mary Sebi. I just wanted to um, thank the committee for the work that they've done on this and um, say that I do, I, I do support this ordinance. I believe the whole issue is more of a zoning issue um, because these are commercial businesses that have been allowed to uh, be created in a residential area. I happen to live next door to one. Um, I, I don't feel that this necessarily addresses all the issues, but I do think that it's time to, to move forward with something um, to be able to address the issues that the committee has heard um, in great, great amount. So thank you. Thank you, Mary. Anyone else? Is there anyone online? No hands up? Anyone on the committee like to say anything? So I guess just to verify, if I had a home on a whatever a lake and I have four bedrooms, I can have two people per bedroom, correct? So that's eight plus two. I can have 10 people and that's, that's the limit for the, for the dwelling. Um, is, that, is that correct? As long as the septic is matches the four bedrooms. Okay. Sometimes, yeah, it should, but sometimes, you know, you buy something and you have four bedrooms and your septic, somebody might've added on. So I just want to make that clear. It just has to match. So my neighbors on the lake, they were talking to me about it. I got harped on this past week. So if I came to Hayward from the cities and I bought a place on a lake for three quarter million dollar, and I'm going to retire in 15 years. And I was hoping to make 30% or 50% of that back just by renting out these homes. Well, now, if we let this pass, and unfortunately, I get three bad families in there the first three weeks I try to rent it in the summer of 2025, and I get revoked my license, am I just SOL for being able to rent that place when I tried to buy it as a something for income and then I can't afford it and I, you know, have to sell it or how does that revocation process work, I guess. And are other counties seeing this issue because, you know, they brought up the free enterprise and everything else that we have. Are we going to find ourselves in a pickle if we push this through just for, you know, when it comes to money with over about 600 rentals in the County, I guess that's what I kind of worry about. Matt, can you answer that for Marshall? <clears throat> I mean, just because uh, a license is revocated doesn't mean that it's permanent. So, I mean, we still got to, I think, develop some of those protocols and policies and procedures. But if a license is revoked, it doesn't mean it's forever. 
So we had just got to figure out, figure out what that protocol is to get that person back on track. You know, is this a, a year's time or what? I, I, I don't have that exact answer. That's something that we have to develop. But, um, you know, the, the likelihood that many of these uh, facilities would be revoked is I would think there wouldn't be a, a lot of them. Right. So but we want to make sure that we have something in place that's solid that we can be uniform across the board with so that we're fair to every type of situation and scenario that comes across that we come across. So um, but yeah, I mean, so if I understood your situation that you presented there, that, you, that somebody bought that facility and then after a year they got their license revoked doesn't mean that they're done for good. We just got to figure out what that um <clears throat> Time frame of um, revocation is, and and then make sure we you know when make make that individual reapply, and then start that process over and hope it works better. Do, do other count? Do other counties know what they're doing yet for um for when this happens? I guess is there citations involved or? I just was going to add on. I I'll try to answer that. But I want to just dovetail off of Matt. So if 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 the public health officer uh, suspends or terminates a license, there is uh, already in our ordinances separate from the new ordinance. It follows the procedure in fourteen three twelve for denial, suspension, revocation, which there is an appeal process back to the officer. And then there's a second appeal to the human services board that can be made. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the whole idea of having an ordinance is so there is ability to enforce and issue citations. To your um, question, from my experience, um, so somebody comes in and they are a bad apple and the neighbor complains, if I didn't uh, address that or try to change the situation, I could see that that would be a tick against me. But if I went over there and I took care of the problem, I, I would think that that wouldn't be a uh, charge against my situation. Is that correct, Matt? Right, and um, just because somebody calls doesn't mean it's an automatic tick against you. That's not, we have to kind of determine, and again, it would be through policies and procedures to try to determine what the severity of each scenario is, right? So it will be up to our department and our staff to try to figure out what that um, punishment is, that, that it is, I guess. And so, um, you know, just because somebody makes a phone call, is it necessary an automatic check against them? It uh, all depends on what that scenario, I think, will be. Um, but again, it's, you know, how many times does has that happened in the in the in the three months as a once a month for three months in a row okay so that again if it's severe enough that yeah those check marks are adding up okay then it's time to look at what's going on here where is the the responsibility of those owners and owners agents where is that failing and how can we get them on the right track what can we do to try to resolve some of these and make sure that we don't have that as a, a future problem Yes. I don't know if this is to Andy or, or to you. Previously in the last go around, um, I took issue with um, part of it and I didn't see it when I scrolled through here. I don't know if it's been changed um, about not giving notice and just being able to uh, inspect at any time. Yeah, so we did take that language that was presented the first time. We took that out. And so the language that we use is state language. And so we'll see under that, under inspection, it will reference the state statutes and administrative code. That is what we are obligated to, to do. So if we get a, a situation where, you know, unless it's an imminent danger, which that's when our human health hazards are going to come into place as well, there may be... It hasn't happened yet, but there may be a situation where weird time of the night, we might have to take some sort of action, but the likelihood of that is slim. But if it's something, um, a complaint, and we're going to go follow up on it during daytime, regular business hours, essentially, is what we would be 
um, kind of be our protocol to go out and follow up on those those complaints. And my second one is to Andy, if um, what I said before was if the state's already doing it, why as an entity, as a county, are we trying to do that? And I still have that same uh, reservation. But my my next question is, if if we're going to put this to the board, wouldn't we want this to be complete instead of a lot of answers tonight have been, um, well, we don't know. We're going to work on that. We're going to put that language in. We're going to add this. We're going to do this instead of being kind of generic and sending it forward. Yeah, the policy procedure part, I guess uh, this is my interpretation. Nothing would be changed in here. So the ordinance is the ordinance. I would say, um, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but since I know you guys are both law enforcement, I, I think it's just how the office staff is going to respond and what's their threshold. Like, and then I know this came up in another conversation we've had about ordinances, but you know, as law enforcement, you have ordinances you enforce and, and laws, but you still have the discretion as to the threshold of, you know, is this, how big a problem is this? When am I going to write a ticket? When am I going to educate? And that's, I think just what the office He's talking about policies and procedures in the office to address how are we going to handle the administrative side of doing it. So the, the ordinance itself isn't going to change. It's just how they're going to react when they get a complaint or what system are we going to have to document. You know, we, we have an online portal where people can complain, uh, file a complaint with the property. Are we still going to use that? And then what's the timeline for response? And like he said, what's what's going to qualify as a call for service or a, a tick, you know? And I think that's mainly what he's talking about with completing out that. As far as inspections go, my experience in over 20 years, we always make an appointment before an inspection occurs. Yeah, can and I, I guess, oh, sorry. Yeah, can I just answer your other question too about state? So, and again, Matt, fill in the blanks behind me if you want. So we act as an agent of the state. Prior to the county taking on that status, there was a state inspector that went around and did inspections and looked for health issues and safety and here's your state license to operate. Um, so we do that, that's what he does, but it doesn't tie to the, you know, doesn't give us any enforcement if there are bad actors. You know, we can't just go pull their state license. You know, as long as they're meeting the initial health and safety, they continue to operate. So that's why you know, other counties have adopted local and municipalities have adopted um, local or county ordinances. So if you have ongoing issues, you have a way to, to enforce. I know the public comment about it's only as good as the enforcement. Well, right now we have nothing to enforce. So that's why we're establishing an ordinance that gives some parameters to regulate. <clears throat> so that if there are bad actors, we have a way to handle that. And just to follow on that same same sorry I know the, on that same uh, idea is that like Andy's saying we are agents of the state we can only um, write complaints or put in complaints into our database uh, for licensing type violations and some of those are health situations as well but when it comes to trespassing or civil issues or um, you know, some of the other types of complaints, we can't really track that through the database from the state. And so that's why, like you said, all these other counties are implementing these ordinances to be able to address some of these other situations that are developing where we can't enforce it through the codes and administrative state codes um, that apply to our agent status as licensing. I have a question about the zoning. To me, it sounds like spot zoning. Um, if you have a private home and the next home over is doing commercial, in other words, making an income off of their property, is that not spot zoning and shouldn't there be a conditional use permit in place or am I wrong? I should have mentioned here too up front, our uh, council is online for the questions we can't answer and this might be one that she wants to take. Um, Rebecca, do you want to, just so I don't muddle that up, do you want to respond to that? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, this ordinance is not a zoning ordinance. Um, it is a public health 
ordinance. Um, so the question of whether this is spot zoning is not applicable because we're not dealing with the zoning ordinance. Um, and But it, it makes sense. It's a very good question. There are many counties who do regulate uh, short-term rentals via a zoning ordinance um, for lots of different reasons that were discussed at the ad hoc committee level. It was decided that in Sawyer County, it was a best fit to do a health ordinance. Um, and so here we are. Um, but to answer again that, that specific question, we don't have to worry about spot zoning because this is not a zoning ordinance. I'm happy to answer any other questions any of the other um, members may have. Hmm. Rebecca, this is Chuck. Um, so why isn't this in zoning then? Why, if Health and Human Services has a lot on their plate and the mm -hmm. budget reflects that, um, why wouldn't this be through zoning and then through law enforcement? Great question. Um, and I um, am happy to answer that. And I don't know if, um, Matt, if you wanna jump in then as well, if there's other comments. Um, from a from a threshold level, the first reason is because the county is already acting as agent of the state um, for DATCAP. So Matt and his crew are already out inspecting these um, these tourist rooming house facilities, and so by creating a health ordinance that essentially overlays on that work that's already being done it's much more efficient. So from a county manpower standpoint, we've already got Matt and his staff going out and doing the inspection for the state. Now he and his staff are going out and doing the inspection for the county license. So again, it's a very effective and efficient way to use county manpower resources. Um, and so that's, that's one reason. Another reason is because of the volume within the zoning department. Um, you know, there have been suggestions that this be a conditional use permit um, under zoning. Um, the issue there is we would have 600 and some um, conditional use permits going to the um, zoning committee. And that would be a huge lift. And again, um, given that Matt and his crew are already out there doing the inspections as state agents, I think, you know, to, to speak for the committee, I think it was thought this is a more um, efficient and useful way um, practical way to use county labor resources. Matt, do you have anything to add on that? Um, not really. I mean, you kind of summarized it very well, Rebecca. Thank you. But yeah, I think the big part of it is just the sheer number of facilities that we have in Sawyer County. We're a huge tourist destination and rightfully so. Um, many of the counties uh, you know, we saw some of the, the big ones like Door County and um, uh, uh, Bylas Counties. Thank you. And so, yeah, we got, you know, 600 plus to to try and go through zoning to do that. It, like I said, it would just take up a lot of time, a lot of resources when we're already, we can kind of run this seamlessly with our, our agent uh, program and and do the application and review of that. We would ask with zoning's help to review those applications, but it would uh, not take up as nearly as much time. <clears throat> I got a question for Matt. <clears throat> it seems like a lot of this has, has to do with septic systems. Have there been a lot of like failed septic systems because of these, you know, rooming out or short-term rentals and stuff? Um, I, I, I don't have an answer, like, for that exactly. I don't have a number by any means. One, I'm not in the zoning department where those it, permits are issued. Um, so the zoning department would have maybe a little more knowledge. But they might not know that that facility is a, a, a rental, though, either. So um, unless they were to check with us. But that's not how that's working at this time. So, um I mean, overall, I doubt that there's a, a ton of failed systems at this time. Um, but again, we also want to be proactive versus reactive, and that down the road we, you know, are trying to present uh, protect those types of situations from happening as well. Jenny, did you have a comment? 
Yes, thank you. I did want to speak to that topic because that is really the meat, the important issue here um, for a lot of people, certainly for me, being someone who has property on a lake. These houses are being over-occupied well beyond their septic system. If you look online, you'll see that some of them are, are advertising sleeps 18, sleeps 12, when it's a three bedroom septic system and that septic system is probably 50 or 60 years old. I mean, that's just one made up example, but if you multiply that times all of our lake properties that are being rented and that's consistent through the summer, whereas when they were just houses, you know, they might've had a party or two once a year, but it wouldn't, it would not come to that capacity. And we had a septic um, pumping person on the, the committee that also iterated that the usage that they're seeing in these rentals is much more than what an average resident would, would be providing, would be using. So the water is the important issue here. And if we wait until it's messed up, it's too late. We have got to take some kind of action to protect our water, our groundwater and our lakes. I know for me, living in Stone Lake, I have to get my septic system pumped or it's on my taxes and I have to pay for it. And I believe I have to do it every three years. Aren't people on the lake under the same that all the houses are ready, have to be pumped every so often, even if they have a septic system? And to follow with that for Matt, how do you check the septic system? What What is it you're inspecting? You're just going on... Does the toilet flush or how do you, how do you actually do that? Yeah. I mean, we don't actually inspect the septic itself. I mean, the pumpers, they kind of do that when they go out there, but um, as, as a license uh, licensing agent, we check to make sure that, you know, septic systems are safe and secure and that there isn't ponding or things backing up and that kind of stuff. But as far as we are not, certified to inspect, you know, pout systems. That's not our role at this time. And just to add on to that, the um, Eric Wellauer, our county sanitarian, spent a lot of time and effort presenting the committee with endless data on what the capacity is for these systems and how it's determined and how the plumbing is inspected when it's built so that it meets the state standards. Um, we actually bent the state standards by compromising to going with the two plus two. The state's statute only allows two per bedroom. So trying to compromise is what got us to this point. Um, but and I'm not a sanitarian. All I can say is I spent a lot of time sitting and listening to Eric, and he would probably give you a, a lot more detail on the subject if you wanted to ask. But Any other comments? Can I have a motion to come out of public hearing, please? Moved. Motion's been made and seconded to come out of public hearing. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right. Thank you. Number nine, tourist rooming house ordinance, discussion and possible action. Committee? So if we vote yes or no here, does it still just go to the county board anyways? It has to go to county board. Okay. But they just want a recommendation or what are they? Why would we vote on it tonight, I guess? It's going to go to them anyways. I think it has to go through this committee in favor to go to the county board. Okay. Hmm? Clarification, I didn't hear that real clearly. I said it has to pass this committee to go to the county board. And if it, if it fails at the committee, then it goes back probably to the ad hoc. We ha would decide what would have to happen on that. Thank you. Just... Uh, Maybe can I clarify that? Um, you can make a motion to send it to the county board with no recommendation as well. You can make a motion to send it to the county board with recommendation for approval. 
that can be a part of your motion. Either you can make it either way. Well, I'd like to make a motion to send it to the county board with a approval. You need a second. I second that. We've had a, a motion and a second to send it to the county board with approval. Any discussion? Chuck? I still have a, a lot of questions before, you know, I would, would be in favor of this. Um, I'm against overreach of government, and I just don't understand if... Um, if people are doing what they're supposed to do and they have to, and they have to have their septics, if so, if that's an issue, but if I'm a homeowner and I want to have 20 people stay at my house for the next two weeks, I can do that as long as I don't charge them. It's my house. But the, the next question of this slippery slope is we're, we've been doing the Birkin binder since the early seventies. And so the school will shut down and they will have occupancy of I know, I know a lot of money changes hands. At what point do we do we stop and say, well, we should have a part of that? Because, you know, these are people that are technically staying here under the same thing. The difference is these are homeowners that are renting their houses out or their, their rooms out. And, and we as the county have been doing this from the 70s. People rented bedrooms out, but we don't regulate that. So at what point... Are we going to regulate everything? And I just think it gets out of control. I, I um, my understanding is, is if you rent your, Matt, you can clear that up. If you rent it for a certain number of days, then you have to have a license. Yeah. So, I mean, for special events such as the Berkey, um, we do, um, require people that want to rent their facility to get a license. Um, so there's two different ways they could go to go about it is uh, tourist rooming house license where they are vacating the owners are leaving that property and offering that whole facility up to to the renters. Or they could go the route of uh, a bed and breakfast type of license where the owner is on site, they're renting out a portion of that facility. They, do they have to technically serve breakfast? Probably not. But again, there's so there's two different ways one could go about about that. There's also special event uh, scenarios where um, for facilities where we go in and make sure that they're they're uh, providing the essential needs, I guess, like toilets and whatever else for um, larger, uh, say, like the school or. Uh, say a church or something like that. So if they are offering up a type of facility, then yes, they are required to have a license. And that, as far as the DAG cap, the Department of Ag Trade and Consumer Protection is concerned, if you offer a facility up for rent one day, you are required to have a license. I I guess uh, I think that this isn't really black and white yet. And my whole job, my whole career has been black and white. Either you're right or you're wrong. And I guess I don't really know where it comes down to it after we do come to somebody who gets provoked or whatever, I guess. So I'm not comfortable voting on it right now. I'd rather do something weird and send it to the full county board for their uh, for their recommendation or with no recommendation from us. Can we do that instead of for approval? Because I don't think this board is ready for that yet, the way it sounds. We have to vote on that motion first, and then if that fails, then we can offer a different motion. Okay. Correct? All right. So we have uh, a motion before us to send this to the county board with approval. Uh, shall we have roll call? Uh, Ms. Pettit. Nay. Ms. Pearson. Ms. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Savitsky. No. Mr. Van Etten. Ms. Dunlap. Yes. 
motion fails. Oh. Well, Mr. Haney. We oh. have, oh, Jeff Haney. <laughs> no. Okay, continues. Thank you. Okay, so Marshall. So in turn, I just make a motion uh, to send it to the full county board without a recommendation for health and human services. All right, we have a motion and a second to send it to full county board without recommendation. Any further discussion? All in favor, well, let's do another roll call. Let me get one more second here. That was a second by who? Carol. Mr. Savitsky. Yes. Mr. Van Etten. Yes. Mr. Haney. Yes. Ms. Wilson. Yes. Um, Ms. Dunlap. Yes. Ms. Pearson. Ms. Dunlap. I I'm sorry, Ms. Pettit. Did I say? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 I wrote it down in the wrong spot. <laughs> so we have. Yes, Ms. Pettit, you responded, cor yes, correct? Correct. Motion carried. Thank you. Take care of that, Andy. They'll go to the county board next week. All right. Number 10 is the public the hearing for the budget. Do you want to take a... Five minute break. All right. Five minute break. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, public hearing for HHS. Can I have a motion to go into public hearing? I'll make that motion. Sorry. Motion's been made and seconded to go into public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right. Who, who seconded? Jeff. Jeff. So we have no uh, indications that somebody wants to speak. Um, so I will turn it over to Julia. Overview. Okay. So um, setting it up a little bit differently than we have in the past, just kind of going over the budget and the services and how we get to where we get to, which are some of the questions that are commonly commonly asked. Um, so we're gonna go, or I'll go what drives our services. We'll have a little funding overview, just it's very complicated how we get our funding in HHS. Um, then we'll go over services offered and provided by and the budget for each area. So what drives our service offerings? Um, many things are mandated by state statute that we need to have in place. And so as we go through the service lines, you'll see that. Um, we also use the community health assessment. We look at public data. We have internal input. Um, we have issues that are identified through care team meetings. We have outcomes data um, that we're looking at. We receive community input. We have many meetings with stakeholders uh, throughout the year on different uh, topics. We have people requesting services, and then we have to look at funding availability. So our funding sources come from basic county allocation. Um, and state aids. We also can apply for grants. Um, we um, can get funding through contracts where people would contract for services through us. Um, we apply fees to certain programs. So people will pay private pay, uh, privately pay us. We may be able to bill private insurance for some of the offerings we have. Um, we also um, can bill medical assistance for many things. Many of our clients do have medical assistance that are in programs. And then um, there is the Wisconsin Medicaid cost reporting. And I'll explain a little bit of that because that's how we get some funding back um, versus what we just straight get from, from medical assistance. And then um, we have county levy dollars. 
Um, some of our programs require a match from a county levy, so they'll pay um, 75% of the grant and we have to match it with 25% or something like that. Or there's a maintenance of effort in some of the programs. And maintenance of effort means that the state decided to draw a line in the sand that said um, that they took the year 2015, 2016, and 2017, added up how much you spent in that particular program, and then um, said, okay, every year you have to spend that much money. Um, an example, just so that you can kind of understand um, what I mean by that, not all of the programs have it, but, um, and I highlighted just so that I could find it, uh, economic support has a maintenance of, of effort of 98487 So we always have to spend that much money on that program. Um, another program that has it is birth to three. And I think that that's like, it's 59414 So some of the county, some of the dollars um, that come forward um, have to come forward because that's how it was set up with the state. So... So interesting, we don't see that in other areas. Um, so with Wisconsin Medicaid cost reporting, we have this thing called WIMCR, and it is dollars that we can get back from the state every year. And so what it is, is when you bill for Medicaid fee-for-service programs, there's a, a cost settlement component, um, and it compares the cost to run the program to what we actually got back from Medicaid. And then we submit that every calendar year to the state. The state goes through the process of looking at it, um, deriving what we, uh, what the costs were, what funds can come back to us. Um, some of them have like a 75% can come back to, to help make us whole. Uh, some of them are 100% um, that will come back to us to make us whole. Um, and, um, and so that's kind of an additional way that we get the funding, but we never know what that's going to look like. It just kind of comes back the following year. So, um, the cost settle programs that we offer are in green on this. So we offer community support program, um, and, and we offer community or comprehensive community support or com community services, CCS. So you'll hear that often, you'll hear CSP often. CCS is 100% funded programming. Um, crisis intervention we have and crisis intervention stabilization. We have outpatient uh, mental health substance abuse services and we do targeted case management. And just to give you an example of what we get back for funding, is um, is what we got what we recovered in 2023 for services that were reported in 2022. So for our CSP program, uh, we received back six, um, over 65,000. CCS, we received back over 102. Crisis intervention and crisis stabilization, um, our costs actually were covered um, for that. So we didn't get anything back. Um, we were positive there. Um, it's not always great to be positive because they can pull money back from you as well. So you wanna be as equal as you can be. Um, for outpatient, we received 20,000 back and targeted case management, 12,000. So just kind of gives you an idea um, as we go through and looking at the services, uh, what we receive and how that works. So any questions on kind of where funding come or kind of how that looks? Carol. I have one question. Are all the mandated services mandated? Fully covered, hundred percent. No, they are not. Not even close. So we get mandated for services that we need to provide as a county, and um, we have to figure out how best to fund them and and get things done. And some things cost us a lot more than others do, um, which you'll see along the way. Okay. Um, 
we're just going to go through each service area just so that you have an idea of what services are provided. I know we talk about each service area every month, um, but to know that these are the mandated services that we need to be able to provide. Um, and then um, I have in here who is providing those services. So you have an idea how many staff members are working in there. And then I'll have the total amount um, that is budgeted to each section. So for ADRC, um, we are part of a consortium. So some of our work happens regionally and some of it locally. Um, and uh, what we need to have is information and assistance. We have to provide options counseling. We um, provide el eligibility screening for publicly funded programs. We do en enrollment counseling, complete pre-admission screens. We have dis uh, disability uh, benefit specialist services, elder benefit specialist services. Those are to help to get that disability for social security. Uh, dementia care specialist services, uh, SSI uh, eligibility assessment, and residency review. Those are the things that need to happen from the ADRC perspective. And we also have to have adult protective services. So elder abuse, um, and uh, we're looking at investigation, prosecution, education, case management, provide protective services, guardianships, protective placements, um, which require annual reviews, and um, we do interdisciplinary team meetings. So to get all that done, uh, how we have it staffed is we have a supervisor who um, is 50% time providing supervision to the department. We have two information and uh, assistance specialists that work full-time, they're positioned locally. Um, regionally, we have an information and assistance person. Uh, Joni works 50% of the time uh, doing that. And I'll, and I should, did I forget to write that? And she's also, I missed a piece. She's also a 50% dementia care specialist. So she's actually a one full person um, and then, um, or one full job within um or two jobs within one person, excuse me. Elder care benefit specialists we have in-house, adult protective services. We have Rose who works full-time in that, Carol who pr provides 50% of her time to that. And then uh, their disability benefit special or services, that's actually provided regionally and that position is housed in Price County and then comes over here to provide services. To be able to get that done, what I did was um, and show you kind of the the um, kind of grouped it all up into revenue totals. Um, we looked at it from 2023, what was budgeted in 24, and then the 2025 projected budget. So, um, 23, these are actual revenues, was 542. Total expenses was 795, um, and um, that left us 252 behind. So that was coming in off of uh, county levy. Um, 2024, we budgeted 561, 942 in expenses with 380 coming in. 2025, we're budgeting 533, total expenses of 868, um, 335 from county levy, some sort of county levy. As we go through, I'll just kind of show you how that um, plays out. Um, from behavioral health services, actually, I should stop. Any questions on the services with the ADRC? And yeah, you do each of you. <laughs> yeah, the more you, I, you have, and actually what you have in front of you, and Dawn, I'm going to be pulling these up on the screen, but I see some people are kind of peeking at their pages. There's a little bit more detail on it. I use the bottom expense report um, to be able to show you those other pieces. For behavioral health, we um, have the services of Information and Referral Center and uh, Behavioral Health and AODA Counseling. Um, we have we're required to have 24-7 behavioral health crisis intervention services. We do not need to provide mobile crisis and stabilization. Um, or CCS, but CCS is a 100% covered and mobile crisis and stabilization is positive for us. Um, we do have to place people in um, under commitment either in Winnebago or other places 
Uh, so that is kind of our big funding that needs to come through. So, so all of these other programs kind of help support and hopefully prevent that. Uh, community support program um, and transitions, having a CBRF where we would put people into um, for um, placement for those that would perhaps be on community support program and or um, coming out of detox um, and needing sober living. We uh, have operated while intoxicated assessments, the Children Long-Term Care Support Waiver Program, which is 100% fully funded, and then Coordinated Services Team, and that has a 25% match. So how we get our, our services done is we have Alicia, who is a full-time supervisor. So she manages the behavioral health clinic, the CST program, CLTS and CCS. And then Joe Bodo supervises um, the AODA chapter 51, um, OWI, mobile crisis, CSP and transitions. And then um, we do have in there uh, in the budget for a mental health therapist. We were not able to fill that last year. We'd like to give another push at it. Um, if we can, we, when we run those services through CCS, then um, again, that's a 100% covered program. Um, so that's what we would be looking at there. We have our CCS facilitator and OWI assessor, Haley Sands, um, CST coordinator and behavioral health assistant, Allison Carlson, and CLTS service and support coordinators. Ruth Ann uh, is full-time, Terry is full-time, and we added, are adding a third position. Um, we have more cases than we can handle and are falling behind and are getting to the point where we're going to have to put people on a waiting list, which is really not allowed from the state, um, but it is a fully funded program um, through the waiver. So uh, we should be fine with being covering on those. This is one of our bigger uh, budgets that we have. Um, when we looked at 2023 revenues um, for behavioral health, um, we had 2.4, 2,481. Um, our expense totals were 4,161, um, leaving us one point, about 1.7 um, that were not covered expenses. In 2024, we budgeted for 2.3 million um, for revenue and expense totals of 4.1 um, with a 1.8 deficit. And for 2025, we are looking at 2.4 um, in revenue, 4.5 or 4.6 about um, in expense totals with 2.1 not covered. And those expenses, we're seeing those every month as we're looking at our mental health cost reports um, and contracting for other and contracting for services. Okay, children, youth, and family services. Um, we have our child protective services. So we have we must provide intake, which we we'll, you hear us talk about as access and investigation, which is initial assessment. We need to do case management, including ongoing services. We have court-ordered supervision, children in need of protection um, services, termination of parental rights, foster and kinship care, guardianship, and subsidized guardianships. And for youth justice, we must do intake. Um, we need to do assessment using the YAZI tool, court-ordered supervision. We have case management. Um, we use restitution, community service, substance use testing, and electronic monitoring to help with that case management. And um, where we've seen the cost this year, I was used, as you guys have been seeing every month, is our out-of-home placements. What I do want to note is when we were talking about areas that we've identified need due to outcomes, this is one of those areas. So the outcome um, that we're seeing with youth justice is a lot of out-of-home placements. Um, it's kind of like what we were looking at with that high uh, jail perspective, high um, jail capacity that we had for quite a number of years and determined we needed to get on the front end of that and move into diversion to help lower the jail costs um, and occupancy. And, um, and we're seeing some really good 
um, movement in that direction with the jail. Um, we've also, we've, I have identified that need for youth diversion when it comes to truancy, vaping, drugs, and alcohol. That is not included in this year's budget. Um, that would have been um, really adding on, um, on piece that even, even more to the budget. And that's not saying that we, we aren't going to do something about it. What we're doing right now, um, you've heard me talk about braiding and blending dollars and how do we make things happen. Um, we are in the process of applying for grants to put diversion into place and we'll be focusing in on what can we get for funding. We'll work off of that funding totally um, in order to get a diversion program. Hopefully that we can reduce those out of home placements and we would then be able to transfer some dollars into keeping diversion going and lower all of those out of home placement costs. So um, just kind of wanted to Put that in that that's something that we've been seeing de definitely along the way um, and it's looking pretty positive on two grants for us as we move forward um, our supervisor of this program uh, or both programs are is Sarah Nzelskis full-time so she covers both CPS and youth justice we have three uh, caseworkers um, in in CPS um, Erica focuses mainly on ongoing services, Taisa mainly in investigation, Amy um, in foster kinship care. Everybody helps cover different things, but that's kind of their main focuses. And we have a CPS facilitator. Um, we're in the hiring process for that. Uh, that person does access and supervised visits. And then in youth justice, we have two caseworkers, Shannon Krause and Kim Lambert. When we look at this budget, Revenue totals for um, 2023 were 1.8 million um, in expenses were 1 point, excuse me, not 1.8, 1.2 um, and a little bit over 1.2 um, for the expenses. We um, Definitely, we're starting through 23 and into 24, seeing some really high numbers in our out of cost play placements. Our revenue totals are projected at uh, 600,000. Oh, I'm feeling like I got my numbers wrong on the revenue on that for CPS. Well, that might be right though. Forgot that I was mixing, do I have it right? Yes, I do have it right. Um, and then 2024, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking youth justice and I'm on CPS. Um, in CPS and then um, for 2024, where revenues were, are uh, 688,000 expense totals, we had budgeted at 1.1 million, 600,000 um, with a deficit of 900,000. For 2025, we're looking at revenue of uh, 923, um, and then looking at expense totals of 1,200,000. Um, so we are looking at those numbers going down. That was through all that work that they did last year to really start moving kids out of RCCs and into um, lower placement home costs. And um, we're still we're weeding through that, but things are looking a lot better. So one area where we're able to come down into costs. Um, YJ budget, however, um, that one is um, consider going up considerably. So revenues in 2023, 175,000. Expenses, uh, actual expenses, 884,000 with a deficit of 708. Uh, 2024, revenues of 172,000. Expense totals, nine, 793 is what we we're projecting. We're well over that. Um, and, um, um, with a deficit of 621. And for 2025, we're at 187,000 coming in and 1.4 million is what we are projecting for expense totals um, with um, a 1.2 deficit on that or 1.3 deficit. So that's one of the areas that we really need to focus on being able to get those contracted costs down. Um, we've got to be working with the youth at, a, at the front end um, before they end up into that out-of-home placements. 
Economic support services, uh, we're part of the Northern Income Maintenance Consortium. Um, for this, we work through food share, or otherwise you might know as food stamps, medical assistance, energy assistance, childcare, and Wisconsin Home Energy Assistance Program, which is WEEP. We have our supervisor, Shauna, who works full-time. Uh, she's our ES supervisor. She is resolution coordinator. Um, so that's the fraud um, piece of it for the consortium. And uh, she's our WEEP coordinator. We have three um, ES specialists, Melanie, Libby, and Allison just started this week. Um, we had always had three, three on. Um, she's just in a replacement. And um, we have Kim and Emily who uh, share the position of ES specialists along with uh, WEEP um, to manage those pieces. And our revenue totals are 427 in 2023. Our total expenses were 663,000 with a deficit of about 200,000. 2024, we projected 469,000 expenses of 633 um, with a 163 deficit. And revenue totals of 450,000. So our revenue is going down. Expense totals of uh, 696 um, with a deficit of 245. I have to say for the ES, that's the most one that we're most inconsistent or not having a really good idea of where we're at yet um, because the consortium budgets aren't in yet. So we're kind of just have to figure out what we think we might be at, but the, the, we don't know from the state aid and how that all is going to be kind of mixed up. So um, those numbers can potentially change. Okay, for public health services, then um, public health needs to provide services in the foundational public health or foundational public health service areas. Um, and it, they outline it in statute um, and in and, and your level two health department um, as needing to provide services within uh, communicable disease, chronic disease and injury prevention, environmental public health, maternal child family health, access and link, linkage to care. And then we need to follow those foundational capabilities um, as seen in the, in the chart below that. Um, so, whoa, you can't really see that. So assess and surveil uh, community partnership development, um, equity, organizational competencies, policy development and support, accountability and performance management, emergency preparedness and response and communications. So then um, what we did uh, got the service areas set out here that meet that. So in communicable disease, they do sur surveillance and investigation, STD, STI testing, animal testing for rabies, mass flu clinics and public awareness under chronic disease and injury prevention. Um, we do health promotion and events. Some of the key things, um, suicide prevention, drug take back, fentanyl and opioid awareness. Um, we have the Well Women Program, Child Death Review, Overdose Death Review. Um, we have Medical Sharps Disposal. We have Narcan Program, Peer Recovery Coaches, Prevention Coalition, and Healthier Together Resource Website. These are not going to be totally inclusive, but just give you an idea. Environmental Health, we have Agent in the State Program, Drinking Water Lab, Radon Testing, Lead Assessments, Food and Water Investigation, uh, Health Hazard Investigations. In Maternal Child Health, we offer WIC, we have Birth to Three, School Health, Reproductive Health Clinic, Lead Screening and Follow-Up, Newborn Phone Calls and Follow-Up, and our Sexual Assault Response Team. And in uh, access and linkage to care, um, we have clinical, we look at uh, clinical availability, healthcare meetings and updates, linkage to insurances, consultation and referral to clinical care. Uh, we provide emergency preparedness and response. We have the medical reserve corps, social media and events, planning and training for response, local emergency preparedness committee, and supply requisitions and community health assessment planning, assessment and planning. 
So to get all that done, um, we have Julie McKellum as our supervisor and health officer. We have two full-time public health nurses, Jess and Mary. Um, we have a birth to three program coordinator, Lisa, and a birth to three service coordinator, Jen. Um, and then for the other services um, for um, uh, a physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech therapy and the educator, we contract for those because that's really are not a lot of job. Uh, so they all have full time jobs besides that. For our WIC program, we um, have the Wild Rivers uh, WIC now. So we're connected with four different counties. Um, Kathy works directly full time for us, but we uh, they contract for our services. Sanitarians, we have Brian and Becker and John. Environmental technician and water lab lead is Matt. Public health specialist, we have Joyce Knowlton. She's 85% and Mary Johansson at 25%. And we have AmeriCorps members, uh, Jake White, who is full-time, he serves public health. Kenneth Rice um, is a peer recovery coach or specialist. And we have another one coming in and um, those are covered through the opioid grant, but they are housed under public health. When we look at revenue totals for 2023, we had 650,000 um, in revenue, expense of 395, net of 255. We're coming out of COVID, so numbers look really good at that time. 2024, we were looking really well um, at 547,000, uh, expenses of 539 with um, looking good at uh, seven in the positive. In 2025, um, we are projecting 325,000 in revenue totals. So definitely going down every year. Um, we also don't have nearly the staffing in place either that we had. Um, and then our expense totals, um, we're looking at 619,000 with a deficit of uh, 293. And then water program, agent of the state and the water program are a separate fund. And those uh, need to be covered through fees. Um, and so um, we, we keep those in a completely different line item. So in 2023, revenue was 313,000, expense was 387 um, with um, a deficit of 74. One of the things to, con to think about too is the indirect costs are in there, which just kind of get thrown across everything. So we haven't really zeroed out in the indirect costs. It was, it's been more of the coverage of the program. Um, we did raise rates last year because we could see that we were not covering our costs um, because we did have to have three um, sanitarians or um, technicians on in order to manage the workload. Um, so um, in 2024, we are budgeted for 374,000 in revenue, um, expense of 407 um, and 33 um, as a deficit is the indirect costs. And then in 2025, uh, revenue of 389, expense of 409 with 20,000. And then finally, health and how, uh, how our administration supports. So um, we have reception desk where we're checking in people, phones, scheduling appointments. We do the water kit distribution and intake reports. There's all the records management, um, chart prep, record uh, retention, destruction, auditing. Um, we manage the motor vehicle fleet. Um, we do contract management, we do fiscal services, so the billing, the accounts receivable, grant writing, um, fiscal tracking, DS, uh, DHS reporting, time card reviews and disbursements. Um, we do oversight of programs and training for HIPAA, civil rights, all staff training. Um, it's kind of everything kind of falls into that area. Services, so you have me as the director full-time, Carrie Mann as the deputy director, and for admin assistance, Michelle is full-time at the courthouse, Melanie is full-time at the ADRC, uh, Jill is full-time, and um, she kind of disperses across agency and fiscal. We have admin secretaries, 
Kathy Garby supports the Child, Youth, and Family Services. Tanya supports fiscal. And our fiscal clerk, uh, Carol, um, is full-time. So when you look, wrap up the total HHS budget, our uh, revenue totals um, for 2023 were 8 million 500. Our expense totals were 8.8 million 700. Um, and our deficit, whoa, our deficit was 206. I don't know why I got that seven in there, 216. Um, when, uh, in 2024, we've budgeted for 9.9 9, 275, 2025, we're up to 10 million, um, in expenses. And what I did was then bring down where, um, or revenue and expenses, how, where does our revenue come from? And that's what I slotted out underneath. So our state aids and grants, um, cover 5.7 million of our budget. Uh, general property taxes are 2.5 million. Um, fund balance of 1.8 million. So that wraps up that piece of kind of the big overview of the areas. I know. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, it's a lot to wrap your head around. Tried to, I wanted to be able to express all of the things that we've got going on in the area. How do we manage all of those pieces? What do we need to look at to start, um, you know, how do we get some of these costs in check along the way? Um, some of the things that you guys are doing right now is very helpful. Um, that resolutions that had come out um, out from our, our, our board here to the county board, asking for the state to fully fund um, the CSP programming um, and make that whole, as well as the mobile crisis and intervention. Um, th those are real big moves for us um, because we tend to have a number of people who are under commitment, and that means that we are actually having them under court order to take medication. And our CSP program is what helps support them to do that and hopefully keep them from cycling and, and um, cycling into crisis and then having to be put in commitment at Winnebago or um, Willow Creek, um, which can get quite expensive. Um, so, you know, trying to manage up some of those, and that's probably one of the bigger area of costs. Uh, some of the other areas that we can really work on is really trying to take advantage of any grants and things coming through. The other thing that we're really working on is um, now that we have Carrie Mann here, um, who is sitting next to Julie, you guys have seen um, Julie before. Uh, Carrie has been really working on our billing um, and looking at how we can make the best use of all of our staff time. We're really working on electronic billing. What are some billing pieces that we've been missing that we could be billing medical assistance for? How do we get as much funding in as we can to kind of over overset some of these things? And then we'll be looking at um, are there other contract negotiations or methods that we can do to help reduce the costs. We're laying it out with where we are right now, where you know we, we hope to be able to project or we hope that we are not going to be using that full budget dollars. But we also have seen in the past where we didn't budget when we used to not budget for people in Winnebago and then we'd be $1 million in the hole. Um, we don't want to go back to budgeting in that from that perspective either. So... Um, so that's, that's kind of some of the pieces in a nutshell where those are. Um, we can go into, well, do we want to pause for questions and, and do we want to dive in a little bit deeper into any of the budget areas, um, as we look through some of these specific areas? And I, I'm not going to pretend that I can answer every question. <laughs> I have one question. Uh, mm -hmm. Several years ago, I don't think you were in that position yet, but we got rid of the Oasis 
and mm -hmm. that was a placement that the difference now when we're looking at these budgets um did we back up with that move by is it costing us more money for that particular but, part and you know what and you're right i wasn't in this position i can i can do a little bit of speculation um just because i was here enough to hear some of those conversations um and to me, it sounded like we didn't have the right ki the right kids for the right placements to be able to do that. I don't know if they were so high end that they had to go someplace else or not. Um, if you ask Sarah, she would say she would love to have that available right now for us to be able to use. Um, but then when I do look at some of the placements that we do have right now, they're really not in like an RCC or a low, lower level. I mean, we have these kids in 180 programs and JDC, like they're in pretty high end Oasis wouldn't have been a place for them. So, um, but one of the things to speak to that is with these grants that we're looking at being able to get, we're looking at um, hopefully being able to have more intensive family, um, youth and family services that would be in the home to hopefully be able to keep some of these kids in the home with intensive services rather than, you know, moving them into a higher level of care. Good question, though. <laughs> it's always that hindsight, like, oh, what did we do? Right? Yeah. Carol, um, can you just for the, can you turn on your mic just so that? Isn't that being used now for the ARDC? And isn't there um, offices on the opposite side? Yeah. So, so is it revenue equal now for the building uh, itself? I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm looking to Andy and that he probably knows those numbers better, or maybe not. You don't know either. Uh -uh. I, I don't know exactly. I know I've looked at the financials from back when just this, that predates me, yeah. but I had looked at the financials when the decision was made and the, the county was effectively losing money on that operation when it was operating it as a right. residential it was. facility. It was. So at this point, we're not losing money. We're not, I mean, we make a little rent off of the um, side of the building that isn't ADRC. Right. But, you know, it, yeah. it's not really a money maker either because we have occupancy costs for having ADRC down there. Mm -hmm. so we, aren't, we aren't losing money. Maybe that's the best thing to say. Yeah. The other thing to speak to just thinking about another, whole, you know, CBRF that we have with transitions um, and, you know, sometimes you can look at it and go, oh, that's costing us money um, for that programming. But the costs of what it would cost to send somebody out someplace else would be much higher than what it is to keep that. The other thing that we're doing there is we're really looking at trying to keep those beds full. So we are working with other counties and really have been pulling people back into that area. It wasn't filled very well for 2023, 20, well, even the, maybe at the very beginning of this year. Um, but we have been really working that system pretty well. So I'm feeling like our numbers are going to start looking better. We base budget, of course, on what we've seen historically. So, you know, I am projecting that it's going to look a little bit better uh, going in for that. So hopefully some of those costs will get recouped too. Anybody want to dive in any deeper into budget numbers? <laughs> I don't know how how far how far in you want to go. I know um, you know sometimes we dive in really deep. Even the other thing to think about is what what you know what do you want to see every month? Like how how deep in do you want to go? Uh, we don't have to have that as a discussion right now. But I'm open to what would make most sense for you guys as we move forward. Well, I know I asked earlier um, when I was looking at services that. Uh, the legal fees were huge and and you adjusted your budget for a continuation of that level of yeah we're going to continue we'll continue to need legal services um 
hopefully we're kind of getting down in some of the areas like, well, and I shouldn't, shouldn't even say that because I think we just had a major legal expense on Friday because I didn't leave here till 8.15. We were in trial all day long. So legal services that day was probably pretty high. So it kind of ebbs and flows, but yeah. And um, part of the other legal service increases um, also is happening through obviously um, things that we're doing with tourist rooming house and things that is happening with um, CPS. We're getting, trying to get permanency, get different things moving forward there. So there, there are legal costs along the way. So I don't want to say that those are going to be going down at this point. Um, some things that we just need to work through. Um, I don't anticipate that to change a whole lot for 25. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. It was a thorough overview, and I really appreciate all the uh, work that you went. I will also this. make pull printoffs of all of that, and then um, because I owe you guys um, binders for HHS, so then you can kind of have that to kind of reflect on in your spare time. But sometimes it is nice to be able to look back and say, okay, what, what did they do there? So I'll get you that. With that, um, may I get a motion to come out of public hearing? I'll make that motion. I'll second. A motion's been made and seconded to come out of public hearing. Any discussion? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. We are at public comments. The public left. <laughs> Let's move on. Committee reports. Do we have anything from LCO? All right. Do we have anything from the Senior Resource Center? Did you write a report in there? I don't remember. Okay. There is none. Marshall. Okay. Oh, and Marshall's on the committee. Do you have some? Oh, okay. Do you have an update for Senior Resource Center? Okay. <laughs> Um, senior resources I just want to make one comment as we go into the budget it might become like a discussion that you know they've asked for an increase this year of twenty thousand. I think we've included an increase of ten thousand. Um, we've met with them a couple times and we're and I say we it's Mike and myself you know we'd like them to take a look at improving the operation and the different ways of doing the meal prep um, so we're not just going to give them the additional funds they'd asked for. I would like to work with them a little closer. So that may come up during budget meetings as to why we're not giving them, or at least at this point, we're not putting in the budget the full request. We did put an increase in because we acknowledge food costs have gone up, but um, we just we have some, some issues we want to work through with them to improve the food prep and delivery and make sure we're serving them. The Can we put money into their roofs? Because they have to get a new roof on that building. I believe the budget was like, wasn't like sixty thousand dollars or something for the roof for like medium average for the three or four days Yeah, we have they have not brought that to us. I know I heard you guys talked about it in there. You know, and that's something we'll have to talk about because they I mean we've approved last year, even though it was happening already, some informal in-kind contributions like some storm removal and mowing the grass. And if they have some maintenance needs, our maintenance guys will go over and um look at it and I kind of diagnose if it's quick, they'll help them fix it out. But really they're a separate entity. Like they're a separate corporation. We don't have any um, ties to them outside of providing some financial support so they can operate primarily the meal program. We do have some funding that works back and forth with ADRC, but outside of that, they're, they're actually contracted by the state to deliver the senior services programs. So uh, I'm getting a roundabout answer to say, I don't just want to say yes. You know, if somebody doesn't help them, I don't know how they afford to put a new roof on or fix a roof, but we're also not obligated to underwrite their program because they do get state funding uh, to deliver some of their services as well. So it's something we'll need to work through, but. Uh, do we have, do we, we missed number 11 that it, oh, 
I, I'm I think sorry. I think we need to just say, okay, yes, we can move this forward to the board. I think is Let's what we back need to, to do. Number 11. <laughs> Proposed budget discussion and possible action. Do I have a motion to approve the budget and move it to um, county board? Second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve the proposed Her budget Excuse and move me. it. Might you say who was the first? Carol. Okay. Yeah. And second by Marshall. Uh, <clears throat> Motion has been made and seconded to approve the proposed budget and move it to the county board. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay. So. Now we're going well, to get down to 14, <laughs> administration. Okay, I just have um, two quick things and, oops. Um, I just wanna make everybody aware that there is um, on September 21st, there are going to, there's the walk for tomorrow um, it's a mental health suicide prevention walk and um, two local walks with one message. And um, on September 20th, it's going to be at Hayward High School. And at September 21st, it'll be at the Winter School. So um, this is a, a unique way um, for us to be able to do this, um, connecting with um, Stacy and Jess um, and um, and working with um, Pat Shoes to be able to move this forward. And um, it sounds like we're gonna have uh, quite a good number of volunteers for tomorrow's exercise. We're doing the Sawyer County um, Emergency Sheltering Exercise at the Wesleyan Church. Um, wanna come out and take a look. Uh, it'll be um, throughout the day. So if anybody wants to stop by or see a lot of people over there, that's what we've got going on. Um, I don't have anything else on the admin update. Let's move on to adult long-term care. Okay, well, I'm going to keep things short for you guys tonight. Um, you've received all of the reports um, throughout and... Uh, do you have any questions in uh, adult long-term care? I'll give you that seven second pause. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on to the behavioral health report. I don't think I have any updates. I've already given those updates. Okay. Do you want me to just keep moving through, Kay? That'd be great. Uh, <laughs> CPS uh, Youth Services. Um, we are on 17A. Yes. Uh, 17. We can go to, if there's no questions, I'm going to move us to B. Um, and I just wanted to quick do a brief comment on this. So we've got, um, we are celebrating that we have put, have found permanency for five children. They have been sitting out there for quite a few years without permanency. Um, and so they've got homes. That's pretty cool. Um, Does that mean they've been adopted? Yeah. Well, what happens is we have to um, we have to uh, terminate parental rights, uh -huh. and they've been sitting in limbo for a long period of time. So now they can be adopted, and they're moving into their their permanent homes now. So nice. knowing that's their location, we have two more that um, have had some longevity to them, and they're getting really close. So that'll be great. Lots of good work happening there. Okay, Youth Justice Report. Um, I can verbally tell you, and I don't even wanna say this out loud, but we have a couple of our high cost ones that are potentially coming off our books. So um, 
hopefully that um, can stay that way. And uh, then our expense report, any questions? Okay, moving into economic support. Um, uh, one piece, I is Shana on? Shana, do you wanna just maybe say about Allison? Well, um, sure. So this week um, we started a new economic support worker, Allison Larson. Uh, she's from the uh, Manitowoc area and we're really excited to have her. She's only been with us a couple days, but she's very motivated and, and appears to be a go-getter. So um, just excited to have her with us. And then the only thing, the report's pretty self-explanatory, but the only thing that I wanted to bring up, Julia, was um, at our supervisors meeting this morning, the consortium supervisors meeting, um, it was relayed that the MAP, the Medicaid purchase plan, which I've spoke on before, uh, those premiums started up again, and they have been extremely problematic, um, the state's rollout was not a good plan. And so um, calls have been made to certain county board supervisors and other counties in our consortium. I know that Dane County um, also has had uh, their county administrator contacted. Um, this has been escalated up to the governor's office. So really, I just wanted to say that's a possibility. You know, you may end up with a phone call related to the Medicaid purchase plan or MAP premiums. Um, luckily, here in Sawyer County, um, we haven't had any major complaints, um, but the, the processing of these premiums has been problematic. We're hoping there will be resolution here soon and that within the next couple months, this is, is a thing of the past. If we do get a telephone call, who do we tell them to call? Um, you can certainly return those calls or forward them to my direction and between myself and the consortium supervisor, Steve Butnick, we will look into those in more detail and try to resolve them for the member. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, public health. Julie, you have some updates? She's got a full report there, but I think she might have maybe something. I probably took your wind out with the sheltering exercise. I did, but that's okay. <laughs> so I'm fully aware that it is like 116 minutes into this meeting, so I'll be very brief. Um, you already talked about the sheltering exercise and the walk for tomorrow. The only other event that I wanted to highlight is Clean Sweep. So that will be on September 25th. Um, we're partnering with UW Extension, along with other agencies, to collect household hazardous waste, along with sharps and unwanted medications. So it'll be held at the fairgrounds. Thank you. Okay. The, the reports are there. There isn't anything um, different the outstanding that we haven't talked about in the past, um, but again, I'd like to introduce Carrie Mann, our new deputy director. So um, she's been really working hard at trying to find some great savings along the way and make sure we're building to full capacity and um, we'll be helping a lot with contracting. She's written a number of grants, which I'm well, I, we're getting one we, we know for sure from the state and the federal grant is looking like we're going to get that one as well. So, and those are to help with that diversion programming. Nice. Otherwise, we'll call it. I don't have anything else. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions on that topic? Any outside committee updates? Any future agenda items that anyone would like to address? Or adjourned? Oh, I'm, Carol. I'm sorry, sorry, Carol. Um, I just like to know what happened after going to the county board, but we'll get a report back. 
We'll, we can at the next yeah, meeting. We'll Danny will bring a report back. We'll let Chuck or Marshall give you an update as to what happens at the board yeah. meeting. <laughs> Don, did Don have something? Don, did you have something? No, I was just going to tell board. everybody good night. Okay. Work in there right Thank now. you. Overtime. So now we are adjourned. <laughs>